Hello and welcome to the course introduction to Bayesian behavior. I am Dr. Arparma from IIT Kanpur. This is week eight of the course, and in this lecture we'll talk about theory of mind, which is a bit about understanding others' mental states. Now, although humans are reasonably good at self-perception and have a decent awareness of their own mental states, as these processes these processes draw from a rich cache of one's own autobiography memories, unexpressed mental states and internal physiological signals, our perceptions of other people are made without an access to their mental and physiological states. Rather, individuals only have access to the limited verbal and non-verbal cues that others exhibit and these are what are used to infer what others are feeling or thinking. During the course of evolution, however, we, uh, we have developed, you know, we have acquired a degree of accuracy in making these judgments about other individuals, which allows us to be able to interact with others or form per social personal bonds with them. In fact, the term empathic accuracy is used to refer to a perceiver's accuracy in inferring another person's thoughts and feelings. For instance, so, uh, total strangers achieve an empathic accuracy score of about 20%, friends have a score of about 30%, and the empathic scores of spouses are found to be between 30 to 35%. As humans are social animals, it is observed that we have developed an ability to infer the current mental state of other individuals, their intentions, thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and desires. Also, understanding the mental states of others is supposed to be critical for a wide range of other social behaviors, for example, cooperation, empathy, and accurately anticipating others' behavior. This ability to infer the mental states of other individuals has been referred to as the theory of mind by David Premack and Jean Woodruff. <clears throat> now, let's talk about how the theory of mind develops gradually. Loads of research has gone into investigating the ability, the development of the ability of theory of mind. For example, infants have been observed to prefer uh, to uh, have been observed to prefer looking at a human face rather than other objects. Moreover, research using ERP has shown that even four months old infants can exhibit early evoked gamma activity at occipital channels and a late gamma burst over the right prefrontal cortex in response to direct eye contact. These findings suggest that infants are very quick at processing information about faces and they do, and use neural structures similar to those found in adults. Even adults mostly focus on the social aspects of the environment. Indeed, numerous studies have shown that adults spend on an average of about 80% of their total walking, waking time in the company of other individuals and up to 80 to 90% of their conversations are spent about are spent talking about ourselves or other people. A lot of in behavioral studies have investigated the development of the theory of mind in children. One of the major tasks being the Sally Ann false belief task. Of what is known from the developmental research into an infant's ability of theory of mind, the following facts have, are fair to see. For example, at around 12 months, babies know that babies are known to babies are known to understand the goals and intentions of adults around them at around 15 months around 15 months uh, infants can show surprise when an adult looks for a toy in a container for a container from which uh, for a toy that has been placed there in their absence suggesting that they understand that the person was unaware that the toy had been placed there at around 17 months, infants can understand when other individuals have a false belief. At about 3 to 4 years, children can recognize that their physical vantage point gives them an individual perspective that is different from that of the other people. By about 5 to 6 years of age, children can appreciate that their mental states are different from other people's mental states and that they can appreciate that different people can have different mental states. Say for example, other people are, uh, say for example, I am feeling sad, the other person is feeling happy. Infants, can, uh, children, uh, young children can actually have a sense of this by around 5 to 6 years of age. By around 6 to 7 years of age, children can appreciate the literal meaning of words that 
when when the little meme words uh, uh, you know they are communicated with only a part of the speaker's intention or that the actual intention will be quite different so the idea is say for example uh, if uh, you know uh, sometimes adults do that that they try and uh, uh, tell children that okay uh, you know suppose a child is uh, you know uh, repeatedly asking for being uh, for having ice cream but the weather is not nice etc so the parents are uh, you know repeatedly saying that okay i will get you the ice cream once you uh, you know do this job so what happens is the infant, that uh, children by this age start understanding that okay why, even though the person is saying this he may or may not actually do it because the actual intention may or may not match whatever the words are being spoken similarly around 9 to 10 9 to 11 years of age children are able to simultaneously represent more than one person's mental state and to discern when one person hurts another person's feelings say for example if if an infant is observing an interaction uh, let us say between uh, you know if a child is uh, you know uh, observing an interaction between let us say the father and the mother or two other friends and one of the persons has said something that will that probably would have hurt the other person by around 9 to 11 years of age children start getting this sense they start being able to represent not even their own mental state but the, that of others and also not just a single person but more than one person's mental state However, some of these observations were challenged by Hungarian psychologists Agnes Kovacs, Arno Teglas, and Anstar Asgard Ingres, uh, who proposed that <coughs> the theory of mind is innate and automatic. As per their proposal, computing the mental states of others may be a spontaneous process, and just the presence of other individuals may be sufficient for an automatic computation of their mental states and beliefs, even when performing a task in which beliefs are in. <coughs> so, Kovacs and their colleagues designed a study to test this hypothesis. Adult participants in their own study, uh, adult participants in their study were shown several animated movie scenarios that started with an agent placing a ball on the table in front of an opaque screen. The ball then gradually rolls behind the screen. Now four things can happen. The ball stays behind the screen while the agent is watching and after the agent leaves, the ball stays full. So when the agent comes back, in, he can pick up the ball from behind the screen. The other thing is the ball rolls out from behind the screen and while the agent is watching and after the agent leaves, the ball does not move, it stays full. So the agent knows that the ball has come in front of the screen and now he can come and pick this up. Third thing is that the ball stays behind the screen while the agent is watching but as soon as the agent leaves the ball rolls in. So now the agent does not know where the ball is. Similarly the ball could roll, behind from, roll out from behind the screen when the agent is watching but after the agent uh, leaves it could go back to its own place. Now again when the agent comes back he will not know where exactly to look for the ball. So, as can be seen in the first two instances, when the agent returns, he will know exactly where the ball is, he will have a true belief about the location of the ball, whereas in the bottom two instances, the agent will have a false belief. They will have uh, expected something else, but the ball has changed its location. So, on the other hand, participants uh, will know the location of the ball in all the four scenarios. Now, what happens is, at the end of the movie, the screen was lowered and uh, either the ball was there or it was not. The participant task was to present a button as soon as they would detect the ball, as soon as they sort of know, okay, here is the ball. Now their reaction times in pressing the button was also measured. Here, the agent, whatever the agent believes is irrelevant to the task and you remember that participant actually knows whatever, uh, you know, the situation is. The researchers predicted that the reaction times of the participants would be faster when agent, when participants and agents both uh, thought that the ball was behind the screen and it actually was compared to a condition where neither the participant uh, nor the agent thought that the ball was there but then it is found there. The baseline scenario was expected to have the lowest reaction rates. Yeah, actually this happened. So indeed, when the participants and agents thought that a ball was there and it was and it sort of plays out uh, with their expectations, the reaction times was fastest as compared to the baseline condition. It was also uh, uh, when only the participant believed it was there, when the participant just went by their self -belief. 
Now, in a condition where the participants did not believe that the ball was there, but the agents did, their reaction times were faster than the baseline condition, but obviously slower than when both of them thought the same thing. Now, this pattern of results suggests that the agent's belief influenced the participants in uh, as much as uh, his uh, very own uh, belief did, even though uh, it was not really uh, the same as the participants' belief. So, it seems that there is some sort of an interaction between the age participants' belief here and the agent's belief. In, uh, it seems that therefore adults can indeed track the other adults' beliefs automatically because see, they are not meant to interact with their belief system but the thing is that in some sense their belief systems are interacting, the, the participant is detecting the uh, agent's belief system. In a related finding according to which uh, even 7 month old infants were able to uh, give a similar pattern of results. Uh, you could say that uh, or it suggests that the theory of mind might be innate and that the mere presence of other individuals automatically triggers competitions of other individuals view. So this is sort of in line with uh, what um, Agnes Kovac uh, and other people were saying. Now let's talk about the mechanism for inferring other people's thoughts. Neuroscientists have long been interested in discovering how the brain supports our ability to make inferences about what other individuals thought processes are and how, what their mental states are and how do we also say for example uh, use the you know other, indiv other individuals non-verbal cues to infer what they are feeling you know if somebody is very fidgety they are moving their hands here and there they are sort of you know uh, pacing around in and out of the room uh, you would automatically sort of you know um, get a sense of that the person is, uh, is nervous or is uh, anxious about something. So how is the brain able to do that how does the brain sort of you know uh, get this. So, to be able to infer the thoughts of others, the perceiver must be able to translate observable behavior, whatever their observable, be observable behavior is, into an inference about what is unobservable, that is the person's psychological state. If I am, you know, uh, making faces, if I am, uh, if I am uh, pacing angrily here and there, if I am, you know, huffing and puffing, you would basically be able to know after some time that I am angry or let us say anxious. So, this is basically what the uh, individuals need to do if they want to estimate the other persons, uh, you know, uh, whatever uh, internal mental states, etc. Now, one of the theories about how this happens is called the simulation theory or experience sharing system. It suggests that individuals observe others' behavior, they imitate it, have a physiological response that is felt, and this physiological response basically allows the inference of what the other person might be feeling. It's almost like, okay, if I were in your place, I would feel this and therefore I assume that you are feeling this. It's, it's, it's a bit like that. Now this process may happen almost unconsciously involving a mirroring system that is similar to that of the mirror neuron systems involved with goal directed actions and understanding of actions. <clears throat> alternatively, another theory basically uh, is there. So alternatively, individuals can influence others' feelings by consciously stepping into someone else's shoes. Imagine that I were you. If I were you, I will do this. Okay. Uh, we were able to perform this task uh, even at times when the target individual is not present. People are able to perform this task uh, even when the target individual is not present. Say, for example, sometimes you think that, okay, uh, if I do this, my father will think like this. If I do that, my mother will think like this. Even if the father or the mother are not exactly standing in front of you, you have this tendency of being able to estimate what they will feel. So this suggests that these inferences involve a slightly more than just behavioral observation and, and imitation. It's not like you are always uh, to be able to understand what the other person will feel. It's not that they should always be present in front of you. Now the mental state attribution theory or the theory theory suggests that individuals may actually build a theory about the mental state of others from the knowledge that has been accumulated about them. What do you know about the person? Suppose uh, my friends know that I am a very patient in a person, that I am a, you know, a person who does not lose, his, uh, lose my calm so easily etc. And then once you pitch a question to them, that, okay, uh, this situation has happened, how will uh, you know, Dr. Alk uh, feel? So they will be able to, uh, you know, on the basis of whatever they know about me, be able to estimate that what could be my possible feeling or what my possible reaction. So this knowledge uh, basically would include memories of others, you know, my uh, whatever I have believed with them, whatever interactions we've had, the memories of those interactions, their situations, their family, their culture and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of this knowledge about the others that we accumulate and on the basis of this knowledge, 
we sort of come at an estimate of what the likely feeling or what the likely reaction will be like. So it seems that although that both behavior reading and mind reading may somehow play a part in uh, this ability uh, of understanding others' intentions and their feelings. Now let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Let's talk about stimulation theory. Now it is possible that a common brain region is recruited for both self-perception and estimating other people's mental states. For example, people may make inferences about uh, other persons based on their own self-representations. Simulation theory puts forth the idea that certain aspects of inferring thoughts, inferring the thoughts about other people, especially let's say in the domain of motor actions and emotions, can rely upon our, the ability, our ability to put ourselves in the shoes of another person. You know, that's simulation sort of a thing. Basically, by using our own minds to simulate what other persons think to what other person might be thinking. Now, one might ask as to how do these uh, simulations reflect in brain activity? Let us look at some of the structures that might be helping in these simulations. <coughs> the medial prefrontal cortex. According to the theory of simulation, there might be an intrinsic relation between the perception of self and the perception of others. This could be one of the reasons why the medial prefrontal cortex is uh, involved in both types of perception. Perception of ourselves and perception of the internal mental of others. Because practically, perception of others may be based in some sense on a better perception of ourselves, you know, our own simulations and how we will feel in a given scenario. For instance, they, they performed several studies over this. So, for instance, in an fMRI study that was carried out by Jason Mitchell and colleagues in 2006, they hypothesized that a similar region would be activated when an individual is thinking about one's own self and a similar other person, but not when one is thinking of an individual who is very different from oneself. So, for example, you know, we pick up friends. Now, we know that uh, friend X is very similar to us and friend Y, although he is a friend, uh, uh, you know, there is this mutual uh, friendship, but uh, uh, friend Y is very different from how we are. So we can say that in a given situation, friend X will act like we will and friend Y will uh, act slightly differently. So in their study, participants were asked to read descriptions of two individuals, one of whom shared similar political views with the participant and the other had opposite political views. You know, somebody was a, a supporter of party A and, the, uh, and I am also a supporter of party A and then the other person was a supporter of party B, which I am not really in support of. So this is basically the setting. Now then the researchers measured the participants' brain activity and answering questions about their own preferences as well as speculating the preferences of the two individuals. Say for example, how will you feel, how will person A feel, how will person B feel. It was found that the ventral region of the medial prefrontal cortex was highly activated for self-perceptions and perceptions of the other similar person, whereas a different dorsal region of the medial prefrontal cortex was activated when talking about the preferences of the dissimilar person. These activation patterns can be taken up as an evidence of the fact that participants may have reasoned that their own preferences would also be able to predict the preferences of the similar individual. However, other studies have shown that is that there might be a variable pattern of the medial prefrontal cortex activation between the ventral and dorsal regions, suggesting that the activation patterns do not really depend on just similarity per se, but also on the level of relatedness between the two people based on familiarity. Say, for example, I will basically be able to uh, predict, uh, you know, let us say how my uh, father or mother or brother will act, as opposed to uh, as a friend will act, or as opposed to as a stranger will act. So a lot of these uh, factors such as familiarity, closeness, emotional importance, warmth, competence and knowledge about the other individual also play a part. Now in another study by Oshner and colleagues in 2005, it was observed that a similar region of the medial prefrontal cortex was active for self-perception as well as the perception of a current romantic partner. It was suggested that this effect was not driven by the perceived similarities between self and the romantic partner, rather on the commonalities in the emotional nature of the information stored uh, about the individuals and their romantic partners. So this result also sort of suggests that the medial prefrontal cortex may be important for thinking about the self and other people where a common psychological process underlies the thought process. I will also, I also like this, uh, he or she also likes this and that is how I am basically able to predict not only my but the other person's emotional states. Now let's talk a little bit about empathy. 
Being able to understand the mental state of others also involves understanding their emotions. Empathy refers to our capability of refers to the capability of understanding uh, and responding to the unique experiences of another person, and this sort of epitomizes the relationship between self perception and others perception. To be able to respond appropriately to others' emotional needs, individuals need the ability to be accurately detecting their emotional the emotional uh, information transmitted by another person. Suppose there is a person and you are great friends with this person. If you are not able to understand what that person is feeling at any given point in time, you will not be able to form a lasting relationship. To be able to do that, you will you have to be able to detect accurately the emotional information that the person is transmitting. You know, the person is feeling sad. It's there on their face. Is there in their uh, you know mannerism, etc. If the person is angry, anxious, <coughs> very happy, all of that. Basically, people are almost uh, you know transmitting emotional uh, information about themselves all the time. One has to be perceptive and able to accurately detect that emotional information. Now, although the details of the process about empathy are not really clear. There is agreement on the fact that the first step in this direction is to be able to take another person's perspective. You know, uh, literally uh, speaking, to be able to step in another person's shoes. So we must be able to, you know, sort of momentarily, uh, you know, in ourselves, uh, create another person's internal mental state in our effort to understand it. How would uh, X feel if I, uh, you know, stole his pen or something like that? Now, the perception action model of empathy assumes that being able to perceive another person's uh, state of mind automatically activates the same mental state in the observer, triggering somatic and autonomic responses. So, you can almost stimulate that and feel that physiologically as well. This observation is consistent with the idea that we can understand someone's mental state by sharing it, you know, by having the same kind of process going through us. <coughs> It has been proposed that mirror neurons may be a critical physiological mechanism that allows us to have the same representation of another's mental state within our own bodies, the mechanism that is referred to as embodied stimulation. Now, indeed, some evidence has actually been found for the connection between the mirror neuron system and the emotion processing system in the brain. More specifically, the mirror neuron system was found to be anatomically linked to the limbic system via the insula suggesting that a large-scale network might underline our ability to empathize with others. Going further, a large body of research suggests that the brain regions that support our own individual bodily states are also activated when we perceive the, the same emotional states for other people. So, for example, in a series of experiments, it was found that the experience of disgust and the perception of facial expression of disgust activate similar regions within the anterior insula. Now, further, the magnitude of the insula activation when observing the facial expression of disgust increases with the intensity of other person's so, uh, facial expression of disgust. So, for example, if you are observing this and the other person is feeling disgust, you will sort of almost mimic that in your own brain itself. And in another fMRI study, it was found that when people inhale odorants that produce a feeling of disgust, maybe you know, sulfur dioxide or those kinds of things, the same uh, regions of the brain in the anterior insula and to a lesser, uh, lesser extent, the anterior cingulate cortex were engaged as when they were observing a facial expression of disgust. So, basically, if you are just observing somebody feeling disgust versus your, yourself feeling disgust, the regions that are activated or engaged are the same. Now, a single case, patient case study of insula damage also provides additional support for mirror neurons in the insula, whereby a patient who had uh, damage to the insula lost the ability to recognize disgust suggesting that the insula is an important region to experience disgust as well as for perceiving disgust in others. In another study by Tanya Singer and colleagues, uh, fMRI investigation showed that the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex are activated when the individual experiences pain in themselves as well as when they are per perceiving physical pain in others. If you stub your toe, if you, pain, uh, you know, pinch yourself, you are feeling that pain, uh, the same regions will get activated, the anterior, the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, as if when you see somebody else stub their toe or uh, you know pinch themselves. Now, when the researchers examined the uh, brain activity of participants, uh, when they so 
when they received painful stimulation through an electrode on their hand or saw the painful stimulation being delivered through an electrode to their romantic partners, uh, it was found that both the experience of pain and the perceptions of a loved one's pain activated the same region, that is the anterior insula adjacent to the frontal operculum and the anterior cingulate. <coughs> Further, participants who obtained high scores on a, on a questionnaire that measured their degree of empathy or showed the highest degree of activation in the insula and the anterior cingulate when perceiving pain in their romantic partner. So if, let us say, uh, you know, uh, your degree of empathy is high as judged by, let us say, a particular kind of questionnaire, it is also that your brain activation will be, will be uh, you know, uh, uh, high in a similar manner. So it basically is that if you feel empathy, uh, the brain regions will also show that and as well as your answers in the cell. Now the somatosensory cortex also seems to have a mirroring system which is uh, engaged when experiencing and observing painful touch or non-painful touch. So according to these uh, studies, another study was conducted with lesion patients which had damage to their somatosensory cortices. These patients were found to be significantly impaired in the capacity to identify another person's emotional state when compared to patients who had damage to other brain regions. <coughs> so all in all, these patients, uh, um, uh, these studies suggest that the same regions of the brain may become engaged when individuals experience an internal state the, as and when they observe someone else experience the same internal state. So this is sort of uh, along the lines of the idea of shared experience and it sort of poses a question, uh, a question of like how do you then determine who is feeling what, whether you are feeling the pain or the other person is feeling the pain. Now Murray and colleagues in 2012 performed a meta-analysis of 23 fMRI and 2 PET studies comparing self-relevant processing along with the processing of close others and of public figures. So the objective of this meta-analysis was to be able to identify self-specific activations as well as activations that allow differentiation between the evaluation of close others and the evaluation of people who we have no connection with. Murray and colleagues found through their meta-analysis that the anterior insula is activated when appraising and processing information about the self as well as very close others such as mother, father, brother, sister, spouse, etc. But not when appraising and processing information about let us say public figures who you have no connection with. You know, some cricketer, some uh, Bollywood actor or somebody. Now, based on the researchers, based on the same, the researchers self-processing. Further, it has been suggested that the uh, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and the ventral anterior cingulate cortex specialize in self-specific processing by selecting representations and mental attributes that fit an individual's own personality. You know, you have a sense of your own personality and you basically, uh, you know, you select those things. So, researchers found differential activations in the medial peripheral cortex for self, close other and a public other and a public figure. Activations for the self uh, were, activations for the self were found clustered primarily in the right ventral medial prefrontal cortex, for close other activations were clustered in mainly in the left ventral medial prefrontal cortex, along with some shared activation engaging the ventral medial prefrontal cortex depending upon the degree of level of relatedness, very close friend, slightly different distant friend and so on. Activations for the public figure or the public other was significantly dissociated from these two regions and just showed greater dorsal medial prefrontal cortex activation in the left superior uh, frontal chiles. <coughs> so it becomes established that the different regions of the brain can are capable of indexing who feels what and so we have a sense of okay these are our feelings, these are the feelings of this close other, these are the feelings of that friend, these are the feelings of let us say what other individual will feel. Let's talk a little bit about the ability of modulation of this empathic response. Now while it is indeed important to experience empathy for others, it might be unproductive if an individual automatically or gets overly affected by the experiences of uh, others. For instance, let us say if a doctor is too empathic, they might not be able to perform a surgery or simply give an injection to patients who feel pain. Jean Dissetti and colleagues uh, have uh, put forward a model which includes stimulus driven processing of affective sharing along with goal directed processing. As per this model, the perceiver's motivation, intentions and self-regulation influence the extent of an empathic experience 
as well as the likelihood of the behavior that would help others unless you are being unless you are able to understand what the other person is feeling very closely you are not going to be able to uh, you know uh, let us say find in yourself to uh, be help uh, to be helping others people not really understand uh, what pain somebody is going through now in an experiment desetti and colleagues hypothesized that regions of the brain typically associated with the perceptions of physical pain would not be activated in acupuncturists whose job requires them to detach themselves with the pain see acupuncture is i am sure you would know acupuncture is a is a chinese ancient medical technique where the idea is that they have these pains and they actually uh, you know puncture your body there are there are there is this entire acupuncture map and there are these very specific spots in the map where that pain has to be inserted and the idea is although it pains in the immediate uh, you know uh, current a uh, situation the uh, uh, these uh, practitioners believe that it has long term benefits so somebody whose job is to give acupuncture should be able to detach themselves completely for what the immediate thing is that right? obviously patients will say this is pain that is pain but uh, just uh, these people will sort of focus on the long term gain and not really uh, you know feel bad about this so to test this hypothesis researchers observed the brain activity of professional acupuncturists versus lay people when they watched the video clips depicting body parts uh, receiving painful stimulation versus non painful stimulation as in previous research regions associated with the experience of pain including the insular and the cingulate cortex and the somatosensory cortex were found to be activated in non experts so these people are actually empathizing with the person in the video they are actually being able to feel the pain there because those individuals are receiving painful stimulation on the other hand in acupuncturists these regions were not significantly activated rather regions associated with the mental state attribution about others what this person must must be feeling etc as such as the medial to prefrontal cortex and the temporal parietal junction were found to be activated also regions uh, involved in executive uh, functions such as self regulation dlpfc and mbfc and executive uh, attention like prefrontal superior uh, parietal and temporal uh, parietal junction were found to be active so you can see that the acupuncturists are much less overwhelmed by uh, a video clip of another guy uh, receiving uh, these painful stimulations so these findings suggest that the activation of the mirror neuron system can be modulated by a goal directed process that enhances and uh, enhances flexible responses researchers have also been interested in studying whether fairness in social relations influences empathy whether you are a fair person or you are a cheater in a study with singer and colleagues in 2006 male and female participants were asked to play a card game uh, involving uh, you know some money Uh, with two confederates one of the confederates were asked to cheat the other confederate or confederate was asked to be honest now fmri was used to measure the patient's brain activity while they watched these confederates later in a uh, experiencing painful stimulation now although both genders had the activation in the empathy associated uh, regions while watching the fair confederate uh, receiving pain the empathy induced activation in the males was used significantly when they saw the cheating confederate uh, receiving pain so these observed reductions were accompanied by increased activation in the ventral striatum and nucleus accumbens uh, which are actually reward association areas reward associated areas suggesting that not only these people are feeling less not only these males are feeling less pain less empathy for the individual who cheated in the game they are in fact enjoying to see the person who cheated in pain <coughs> now these findings suggest that individuals uh, value the gain positively if someone has gained it fairly but not if it was uh, gained unfairly individuals like cooperating with fair opponents but they like punishing unfair ones so this is something very interesting to note now shikara and colleagues in 2011 wanted to investigate whether modulation of empathy could also occur not only just at the individual level but at the group level So in their study in her study that is she recruited fans of rival basket baseball teams so Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees these are two baseball teams just taking an example for you you can imagine let us say 
two teams let us say in in ipl if whether you are supporter of uh, you know chennai super kings or mumbai indians so fans of rival cricket ipl teams etc were let us say they were taken now fmri fmri was used to measure participants brain activations while they viewed simulated figures representing from the two teams let us say a video game sort of uh, making baseball plays let us say playing cricket now in some plays the favored player was successful while in some others the rival player succeeded so in one case uh, your team the one you support is winning and the while the other team uh, while in some other cases the rival team is winning participants also saw some control scenarios where as a third neutral team made plays against another neutral team so there was a neutral match also going on say for example the rajasthan royals and uh, sunrisers had something like that is also going on so there you are not really going to be so worked up emotionally so after each play participants were asked to rate their feelings of anger pain or pleasure when they had when they were uh, you know when they were watching the game after a gap of 2 weeks they were also made to fill out a questionnaire that asked them to rate the likelihood uh, with which they would heckle insult throw food threat and shove or hit a rival fan or hit a fan of the new team so just like how strongly do you feel whether you will resort to physical uh, steps or not now uh, while uh, viewing uh, subjectively positive plays that is in which the rival team play, uh, failed there was an increased response in the mental strata basically saying that you enjoy the loss of the rival team whereas failure of the favored team and success of the rival team activated the in acc and nensel as so you are actually fe- feeling pain at the at uh, your cell so that is basically what it says is the modulation is happening at the group level the mental side reward effect was also found to be correlated with the self report likelihood of aggression against the fan of the rival team so the, the individuals who are more uh, you know uh, inclined to hate the rival team resort to aggression with them actually showed more enjoyment or mental side of acting so finally the response uh, to the rival group's misfortune is neural activation associated with pleasure and which is found to be correlated with endorsing harm against you so, so this is an interesting aspect of uh, how individuals you know uh, carry themselves around in social relationships whether they at the, even at the group level like some group do not like some group whether they would uh, enjoy the other group suffering or they would actually feel pain uh, if the other group is also in a difficult situation i think we uh, stop here we continue uh, the same talking about social cognition in the next lecture thank you